Good evening. Welcome to our worship service tonight. We now are in the fourth Sunday in the season of Epiphany, and we've been following a sermon series called Joining Jesus on His Mission. We've been privileged to follow our Savior, to join Him in sharing the message of Jesus Christ with people throughout the world. But you know, our mission field isn't just out there. For us, it's really right next door. It's in our own families, in our own neighborhoods. And so tonight we'll find out how we can join Jesus on his mission right here at home. The order for our worship service is going to be printed up here on the screens. And this evening you're invited to join and sing along from behind your masks with our soloist as we begin with the first hymn, Lord, speak to us so we may speak, that we may speak. Father, each day is a gift of your grace. Your mercies are new every morning. Guide our steps by the light of your word. Shield us from harm and keep us from evil. Better than life is your love. Put joy in our hearts and praise on our lips. Alleluia. Let us now confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
As we seek to reach out with the gospel to our neighbors and the people around us, the Lord encourages us to hold on to the truth. In the Old Testament scriptures, God sent his prophets to share with the people what his truth was. Chief among the early prophets of the Lord was Moses, who especially focused on the law of God, his do's and do nots. A great prophet now is Jesus Christ, who has come to supplant the Old Testament prophets and has given us the fullness of his truth and especially focuses on the gospel message. We have a savior from sin who gives us full and free salvation through his forgiveness. We read from Deuteronomy chapter 18 where Moses foretells that great prophet to come. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. This is the word of our Lord. Let's join now in reading responsively the words of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Our second lesson today also focuses on the truth of God's word. St. Paul tells the Christians in Corinth that they have freedom, but they do not have a freedom as an excuse to do anything they choose to be able to do. They need to use sanctified Christian judgment in exercising their freedom. Uh, there is a word of explanation that's required for this portion of scripture Paul talks about eating meats that had been sacrificed to idols. The idea is that people would bring sacrifices to idols in their idolatrous worship services, and those meats would be roasted, and then they'd be brought to the marketplace to be sold for food to people to purchase, for people to purchase. Some of the members of the Christian congregation were purchasing this meat that had been sacrificed to idols in an idolatrous worship service. They were bringing that along to fellowship meals in the Christian congregation in Corinth. Some people were greatly offended at that. How can you bring those meats offered to idols to our worship, to our fellowship services here? And other people were saying, well, it doesn't matter because an idol is nothing at all. Paul says to those people who feel they have the freedom to do whatever they want. Just be careful that your freedom doesn't become a stumbling block to somebody else. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. The man who loves, loves God, is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many 
gods and many lords. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news. Alleluia. Please stand now for the gospel of our Lord. The Holy Gospel for this evening is recorded in the Gospel of St. Mark in chapter 1. We're reminded here that Jesus, as Mark explains, taught with authority. But he didn't just teach. It wasn't just his words that came with authority. He also had the power to drive out evil spirits. And that teaches us something about the power of God's word. His word has the power to change hearts and change lives. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were also amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated and we'll continue with our next hymn.
please stand. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Amen. Our text for this worship service is recorded in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, Not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not Enter the kingdom of heaven. So far, God's word, you may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, for, for fun one day this week, I try to add up how many people I came into contact with in a single day. I was surprised. I spoke to, waved at, or ran into 32 people in a single day. Now, I don't know if that's a lot or if it's not much at all, but that was my number for that particular day. Now, I know that number might be a little higher if I tried counting on a Wednesday or a Sunday morning because of worship. And, of course, this now got me thinking, how many people do you think you interact with in a single day. Let's go more than that. How many people do you think that you interact with in a week? My guess is that number is higher than you think. Apparently there are people who actually study this kind of thing. So let's take a few minutes now and do a little mental counting here. What's your number? Well if you're married, there's your spouse and maybe your children, and if you go into work, you might be able to count the people you work with, and that number might be quite high depending upon what you do for a living. But then again, you know, maybe you're still working from home. But then don't forget about that checkout clerk at the grocery store, the hairstylist, the newspaper boy, the mailman, your neighbors, and of course, the UPS, Amazon, and FedEx crew. There's always your friends, think about them, the the chiropractor, your mechanic, and your child's teacher. And if you're a student, not only do you have your family members, you've got your classmates, the bus driver, coaches, and the ladies who make lunch. And you know what? That's a lot of people. Sociologists believe that the average person interacts with 12 people in a single day. Multiply that by seven and the average person interacts with 84 people in a single week. And that doesn't count all the people that you interact with on social media. As we now conclude our sermon series, Joining Jesus on His Mission, today we want to talk about how we can interact with all those people that we come into contact with. And it leads me to ask the same question from a slightly different perspective. Who has God put in your life? I ask because there is a reason. There is a misconception. And there is an assignment. Now, before we can go and identify the people that God has put on your list, I'm afraid I have another question I want to ask. Have you ever wondered why you were born when you were? 
I'll admit, I think about that from time to time. You know, right here, right now, why now, 2021, why, what if we had been born 100, 200, or 1,000 years ago? Think about that. 100 years ago, 1921, not only were there no cell phones, no laptops, no video games, no internet, but less than half the homes in the United States had hot and cold running water and flush toilets. 200 years ago, Wisconsin wasn't a state yet. And 1,000 years ago, America hadn't even been discovered. So based upon all of that, you know, I'm going to come to the conclusion, you know what, I'm so happy God put me right here. And you know what? It is the year 2021. And God put you here for a reason. Living next door to you might be this slightly older couple you don't run into them all that much. They, you know, they appear to be fairly nice. They wave. You say hello whenever your paths cross. They don't seem to cause anybody any trouble. They're nice enough. As a matter of fact, really, the only thing you seem to know about them is they have a little dog, and they take that dog for a walk twice, twice a day. Then one night, there's a knock at your door. It's, it's your neighbor. And in an in a voice of desperation, he asked, have you seen my little dog, Lexi? She got away, and, and I don't know where she is. I've looked everywhere. Is your response option A? No. And close the door and go back and sit on the couch and wonder, why is this guy bothering me? Or is your response B? No, I haven't seen your dog, but wait a minute. Let me grab my coat, and I'll help you look. Speaking to his disciples, Jesus was now coaching them to understand who they were and what their purpose was. He said, you are the salt of the earth. And a little bit later, he said, you are the light of the world. And notice, he doesn't say you will be or you should be. He says, you are. In ancient times, salt was used to help keep certain foods from decaying. However, if salt wasn't used for the purpose of which it was meant, it was pretty much worthless. And of course, light is meant to shine. But if it's covered up, why would you do that? Then it no longer is serving its purpose. And the point of all of this is this. If you claim to be a disciple of Christ, you will be salt. You are going to be that light. You will be. You will be the person that God created you to be. You possess what it is and what it takes to keep someone from decaying into sin and unbelief, and you will also be a light that can and will lead others to Christ. Don't shirk from your responsibility and just try to blend in as low as possible. Shine. Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Be salt. Be light. Don't just go through the motions as far as your faith is concerned. Live your faith. Be salt. Be light. Live your faith. No one ever told anyone that before. The people of Jesus' day seemed to always be thinking that they were told that they were supposed to follow the laws found in the Old Testament. And there were a lot of laws. There were laws that told them when to worship, how to worship, when to sacrifice, what to sacrifice, when to work, when not to work. And as a result, there was a misconception among people as to how a person was supposed to be saved. There were many people who believed that they were going to be saved based on how well they kept the law. So was Jesus now proposing something new, something different? No. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus was not proposing anything new. Far from it. He made it very clear that absolutely nothing has changed. God still demands perfection from you and me. 
You must be perfect in order to enter into the kingdom of God. God must still come first. Do not misuse his name. Remember to worship him. Honor your parents and others in authority. Respect human life. Do not give in. Think about or give in to sexual sins. Don't take something that doesn't belong to you. Respect your neighbor's name and reputation. Don't covet. The rules still apply. Nothing has changed. And so don't try to change anything, and then don't try to leave something out. And whatever you do, don't try to say, hey, these rules don't apply to me, because they do. Jesus concluded by saying, for I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa, who could do that? Who could keep the law perfectly like the Pharisees? They were the holy of holy ones. Ah, but everyone knew that they didn't keep it perfectly. And so the response is, nobody can do this. Nobody can keep the law perfectly. And neither can we. Try as hard as we might, we cannot keep God's law perfectly. How can we? We're simple human beings. We sin every single day in thought, word, and deed. Try as hard as we might, we still sin. And as a result of our sin and our inability to meet the demand of a perfect and holy God, we deserve to spend eternity in hell. But God the Father could not bear that thought. So in love, he did something about it. He sent his own son to earth. He had Jesus become human. Had him live the perfect life we never could. And then Jesus freely and willingly gave up his life in place of your sins and mine for the sins of the entire world. Don't you see? Jesus did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. He came to do what sinful human beings cannot do. When God the Father demands of you and me, put me first in your life, Jesus steps in front of us and says, I did, and I always will. When God the Father demands of you and me, have no unclean thoughts, Jesus steps in front of us, I never did. And when God the Father demands of you and me, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy, Jesus once again steps in front and says, I am, and I always will be. This is God the Father's plan of salvation. He sacrificed his own son so that Jesus' holiness and righteousness might be transferred over to us. And now by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, all those who have been led to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior are once more declared to be holy and righteous in God's sight. Not because of who we are or what we have done, but because of what Jesus has already done for us. We are saved by grace through faith. You know that. You believe it. Be salt. Be light. Motivated by the love of Christ, now carry out your assignment. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You have a co-worker who is usually outgoing and always smiling, but lately she's been pretty quiet. You notice she looks exhausted and that she's been crying. So you go up and you ask, how are you doing? What's going on? And she confides in you or to you that her mother is very ill. She's not only caring for her own family, but she's spending as much time as possible at her parents' home so that she might help in any way possible. She's cooking, she's cleaning, and whenever possible, she sits at her mother's side holding her hand, praying for her, and trying so very hard to keep it all together. Is your response A, I'm sorry to hear that. Just make sure that report gets done by later today because I need it? Or is it option B? How can I help? Can I bring dinner by for the family tonight? And with your permission, can maybe I tell some of the others, you know what, we can get a meal train going and then you won't have to worry about cooking and maybe we can volunteer some of our own PTOs so that you can spend some more time with your mother 
And you know what? That report, don't worry about it. I got it. Be salt. Be light. Live your faith. Everyone in your family is looking forward to next Sunday. It's your parents' anniversary. And they're bringing everyone together for dinner. Your parents managed to find a place large enough for social distancing. All your siblings, nieces and nephews, everyone's going to be there and you wouldn't miss it for the world. However, there's one thing bothering you. You know you're going to see your brother and his family. What's bothering you is your brother and his family haven't been in worship in a long time. And so you're worried about them. You don't want to see your brother fall from faith. You love your brother. You want to make sure that he spends eternity with you in heaven. And so when the opportunity presents itself that weekend to have a little moment with your brother alone, is your response A? You never say what's bothering you. And you choose instead not to get involved because you really don't want to create any more family drama. Or is your response B? Let your light shine. Hey, haven't seen you in worship in a while. Everything okay? Anything I can do? And then you can go and share maybe some of the things going on in church or in school, and then you can always finish by saying, hey, hopefully I'll see you in worship this next week. I'll make sure, make sure to save a seat for you. Every day... Every week, God puts people into our lives. And what we say and how we act is noticed. You are going to have opportunities to let your faith shine. Be salt. Be light. Live your faith. You are an ambassador for Christ. You possess information that the people God puts into your life desperately need to hear. They need to hear who Jesus is and what he has done for them. They need to hear that Jesus is the Savior of the world. So now please, go carry out your assignment and join Jesus on his mission. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which has changed your heart and mine, empower us to share what we know with those we love and those we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. We now have an opportunity to confess our Christian faith, and we do so using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Please stand now for our prayers. 
This evening in our intercessory prayers, we will be remembering Daisy May, who is the daughter of Brian and Deanna Pitson. She will be baptized here on Saturday, and also Raina Lynn, the daughter of Tony and Deidre Betcher, who will be baptized here on Sunday. We include Bobby Brandenburg, who underwent surgery this week, and we also include Margaret Henze, the mother of Pastor Henze and Carolyn Henze. Uh, the Lord appears to be calling her home at this time. Each and every day, O oh Lord, you place people into our lives, people that we interact with in some way, shape, or form. Lord, we pray that you empower us to be what we are, to be salt and to be light. Empower us to live our faith and to reflect the love of Christ so that others might also be drawn to him. We admit that we haven't always seized the opportunities you've given us to share your name. Forgive us, Lord. And now strengthened once again by your word, may we leave here today ready and willing to carry out our assignment and to join Jesus on his mission. We ask this, Lord, in your name. We also come before your throne to rejoice with the Pitsons and the Betchers as their daughters become your children through the sacrament of holy baptism this weekend. May the faith created in Daisy May and in Raina Lynn continue to grow. And may we, as a congregation, stand ready to encourage them in their walk of faith. Lord, we also ask that you continue to watch over Bobby Brandenburg following his surgery. It is our prayer that he be granted complete healing. Give him patience and give him peace. And lead him and his family to find their comfort in knowing that you will hear and answer our prayer. We also pray that you be with Margaret Henze. And we pray that you assure her of your forgiveness and your love. Bring peace to her soul through your word of peace and bless the family with the hope of everlasting life in heaven and assure them of your promise that you will never leave them or forsake them. Lord, we bring all these requests before your throne as now we join together to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated now as we continue with our closing hymn.
Good evening, everybody, once again. A couple of announcements that we would like to make. First of all, just a reminder that uh, pastors are willing and able to provide private communion. For those who would uh, prefer to receive that privately, we can either come to your home, make an appointment, and come over to your, your home or a, a loved one's home to provide communion there. Uh, most often we do it here, and a number of people do take advantage of that opportunity. We come right into the church have a little devotion and communion service, and then you can go home. Uh, our 2021 marriage seminar is going to be held on Saturday, February 6th uh, in the morning, and that will be for those couples that intend to get married over the next year here at Trinity. So if you haven't yet let us know about a marriage that's coming up, please uh, inform our church office, and we'll make sure you're invited to that marriage seminar. Women's Bible study, uh, there is going to be a video-based Bible study that uh, our women's, uh, women's group is going to be having beginning Tuesday, February 9th. Uh, Sharon Steinfest and Judy Abel are organizing that. If you have any questions about that, you can contact either one of those two. There's an announcement with regard to this Bible study in the church newsletter. It will be on Tuesdays for seven weeks at 6 p.m., and there's both an in-person and online option for being a part of that discussion. And then finally, Financial Peace University, something Pastor Janish has organized, is going to be uh, held uh, beginning on February 18th. More information about that is also in the church newsletter, and you can check that out uh, as you, um, if you're uh, interested in taking part in that uh, financial seminar. Those are the announcements for this evening. We'd like to wish you a pleasant evening.